stretches further at Mattress Firm. It's the BMW Sports Desk. Get the inside story with highlights, interviews, and more after CBS 4 News tonight. Sponsored by your South Florida BMW centers. Get your weather first with meteorologist Lisette Gonzalez on CBS 4. Now, from CBS 4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy and welcome to Facing South Florida. It's good to be back and there is certainly a lot to get to this morning. Later in the show, we will look at the impact the U.S. trade war with China is having on the Florida lobster industry and what it might mean for anyone here who likes fresh lobster. We also talked to Debbie Mercalso Powell, the Democrat running against Republican Carlos Cobello, in what is one of the closely watched races in the country. But first, at the World Cup captures the world's attention, and particularly folks here in South Florida, the long dragged out on again, off again plan to bring a professional soccer team to Miami appears to be finally taking shape. Next week, the Miami City Commission will vote on a plan to turn over public land at Mel Reese Golf Course for a soccer stadium that would be built by the investment group that includes David Beckham. If it clears the city commission, then voters in Miami would have to approve it in November. There's a lot more to the plan than a soccer stadium Stadium and joining me now to discuss it is Miami City Manager Emilio Gonzalez. Emilio, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for the invitation. So, as I understand it, you are recommending this deal. So, let's talk about what this deal entails. Give us the broad strokes. Well, this would be a deal which would allow David Beckham and the Moss Brothers to develop uh, what is now Mel Reese Golf Course into what I think would be the capital of soccer in the Western Hemisphere. It would be a stadium, it would be multiple soccer fields, it would be a public park for the residents of the city of Miami. There would be a business component with um, stores that cater to the sports industry, uh, perhaps even a a, um, sports medicine institute and a technology hub to boot so all of these different businesses would feed into the sports business if you will and really put Miami on the map so one of the concerns I think people automatically have is when you see green space there's only so much green space that is in any city in municipal area this is a large section of green space the fear is, is that when you start paving over it by putting stadiums and 128,000 square feet of retail or office space and retail shopping and other components, that you're diminishing the city overall. What do you, how would you address environmentalists who say we shouldn't be taking green spaces off the map? Well, I would tell you that there will be actually more available green space for a much greater number of residents right now unless you're an avid golfer and you have eighty dollars to spend golfing th that green space doesn't exist for you what we're seeing here is an opportunity to not just have a park a true public park developed for the city but actually have a series of public soccer fields that city residents can use in addition to the stadium so here are some of the numbers you're roughly looking at 10.5 acres of the land going for a 20,000 seat stadium 138,000 square feet of retail and restaurant space 12,000 square feet of music and entertainment space and regarding the park that you're talking about it would be a 58 acre park that would be developed and funded by the Beckham group 20 million dollars that they would fund for this and let's talk about the dollars by it's way, not just the, the, by the way they, they would create the park and then they would give us the money to maintain the park and and what public dollar other than other than providing the land which I must which you're leasing to Beckham Correct. for a fee of somewhere between three and five million dollars a Correct. year and we'll, we'll work that out because the way it's structured now it'll be a, a square foot price and it will also be dependent on appraisals. So there's a ballpark in there, but I'm expecting it'll be at a minimum three and a half to four million dollars. And it would also go on the tax roll, so the Correct. Beckham Group would now be paying taxes Correct. on land that is not accrued. So what is the financial benefit for Miami, do you estimate? Well, overall, uh, just from a tax base perspective, it's worth about $40 million overall. To Miami, it's about 10. I will tell you that the, the county has a benefit here to the tune of about eight or nine million. The school board will be getting some money and the state will probably end up getting the, the largest chunk of this tax base. So as you and I were discussing it on, on Thursday, the commission will vote and if the commission approves it what, it, what they're approving is to put it on the ballot in November for the voters to vote on and then if the voters approve it, then you would begin earnest negotiations with the Beckham Group for all the fine points and details. 
details. Right. What we have now, as far as the um, the resolutions, are the bottom line. Th these are these are our markers that we'll lay down. The commission, not all members of the commission um, are interested in this project. Some more than others have been quite vocal against it. Some have been very vocal for it. But what we want is to let the voters decide. So once the commission decides that this will go to referendum, the voters will vote up or down vote in what November. Happened, what happened to Overtown? There was so much talk about the Beckham Group coming in and initially they were going to go into Overtown and help redevelop that area. What well, happened to that? Overtown is still in play. Um, I will tell you that I'm sort of fixated on, on the stadium, but I will tell you that Overtown is still in play, not necessarily as a stadium, but the ownership group does have plans for Overtown and to develop that track of land that they own. Let me ask you this. Uh, I think folks in South Florida still have a bad taste in their mouth from the Marlins stadium deal. They were promised that there was going to be a stadium with all this retail space and restaurants and it was going to be a boom to the surrounding community and here we are years later and it's a, it's a, it's an elephant. It just sits there there there's very little development around it. Why do we should we believe that this deal is going to be different than the Marlins stadium? Well, deal? first of all, the Marlins stadium was done with public dollars. This is being done with private dollars. So the developers are assuming 100% of the risk. Secondly, we still haven't really negotiated the business aspect of the deal, which has to go back to the commissioner once that's done. So there are any number of things that we could put in there, reverter clauses if we need to, um, to ensure that, that the taxpayers will be taken care of. Maybe profit sharing, if there's some profits to be turned well, in terms of that's that? That's something we could discuss. Again, you, you have profit sharing if we were to go in with them as far as part of the investment. Right now, they're putting up a billion dollars. Well, let's see, see. The first step is obviously get through the commission. If it passes there, I'm sure we'll have a lot more discussions. Oh, there'll be many discussions between you know next week and, and November. I want to just turn my attention for a second because many people may not know this. You're a retired U.S. Army colonel. In 2005, you were approved by the United States Senate to be the Department of Homeland Security undersecretary that oversaw Customs and Immigration Services during the Bush administration. You served in that position for two years, essentially the precursor for ICE. Well, adjoining, I was immigration and, and citizenship, so we were sister services, but we worked together quite a bit. Talk to me, I, you know, I don't want to draw you into a political discussion. You're sort of apolitical at this point, or try to be. When you look at the calls to abolish ICE, when you look to, you know, what you see in terms of the family separation at the border, give us your impressions. I'm just sort of curious what goes, what you see as you watch this. Yeah, I, listen, I, I think that uh, the calls to abolish ICE are very, very short-sighted. ICE is an excellent organization. ICE is the organization that's out there fighting um, human trafficking, fighting human slavery. Uh, this is an organization that, that is a very, um, a recent organization, but the people that work there are very honorable. They're doing what they're being told to do. So it's for somebody to say, oh, the only fix here is to abolish ICE, I think it's a pithy campaign line, but it really doesn't serve the purpose of having greater and deeper immigration reform, which is what this country needs. Are you concerned by any of the images that you've been seeing on television? I am concerned about the images. I also get calls from a lot of colleagues um, in, in the capital area. Uh, some of them are heartbreaking. Um, there are images that people don't see of uh, people trafficking in small children. So, I mean, it, it really is a very, very complicated issue. My, my, my big tagline um, when I was in Washington is that Americans love immigrants, but they hate immigration. And, and it's when you think about that, it's the whole process of how one gets here. Um, it's convoluted, it's complex, you, it's a whole niche market in the legal profession. There are immigration attorneys for a reason, just like there are tax attorneys for a reason. And I think that until we really wrap our arms around how we want this country to look, what we want this country to be, and actually take steps in that direction, I think we're going to be having more and more of these images on TV. Just on the issue of ICE for a second, do you agree, though, that there probably needs to be some reform? Um, ICE does what they're told to do. The reform has to be at the policy level. These guys just don't go out willy-nilly and start separating families or arresting people for, for traffic violations. They do what they're told to do. Do you think that's a good policy to separate families as a way of trying to deter others from coming? I think that separating families is a very bad idea, quite frankly. Listen, I'm an immigrant myself. Um, I, 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 I struggle with the upside of separating small children from their parents. Emilio, I really appreciate your, your coming in and Thank talking you, about all of this. We'll be watching the commission vote this Thursday. Thank you. Hope you'll be right. there. Well, it'll be fun <laughs> for sure. Up next, Democratic candidate for Congress, Debbie Mercalso Powell, when we come back. Hey, guys.
Stretching from Key West to Kendall, the 26th Congressional District is home to one of the most closely watched congressional races in the country. Democrats believe winning the seat currently held by Republican Carl Scarbello is critical to their effort to take control of the House. And the Democrat hoping to win that seat, Debbie Mercaso Powell, is joining me this morning. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you, Jim, for having so, me. So I want to pick up on the conversation I was just having, mm -hmm. you know, just a few moments ago with the Miami City manager who was former head of immigration during the Bush administration. Let's talk about immigration. Let's, let's specifically start with ICE. A number of Democratic candidates running this year have called for ICE to be abolished. Mm -hmm. Do you call for ICE to be abolished? I think that the problem here is Trump, the president and his policies, and um, I am, as an immigrant myself, extremely concerned about the actions that ICE has taken. I mean, I know that the director of ICE has warned immigrants to be looking over their shoulders, stalking uh, bus stops and, and other areas. So I'm definitely concerned, but they're following clear instructions from the president. Um, they need to be focusing, instead of harassing immigrant communities, they need to really be focusing on what the city manager was mentioning, which is human trafficking, which there's a huge problem with that in this country, and, and that's where they need to be focusing their efforts. But I don't want to take the responsibility away from this administration and the divisive policies that they've um, instilled, especially in with immigration, in regards to immigration. So let's talk about immigration more generally. Carlos Corbello has generally been given good marks for attempting to shepherd through a bill through the mm -hmm. through the House of Representatives to solve some of the immigration problems, to give a pathway to citizenship for the DACA kids. What makes you think that if you were in the in the in the House and the Democrats were in charge, that you would be able to do any better? Well, Jim, very good question. And I have to tell you that my frustration with this congressman is that he says a lot of things here, says that he's trying to do a lot of things, but I don't really see a lot of action. Um, there was a bill that I keep mentioning that there was an opportunity to pass a Clean Dream Act back in December where it had more than 200 co-sponsors. Congresswoman Ileana Ross Layton actually signed on to that bill and Curbelo didn't at the time. Um, I know that he recently did as we were getting closer to election. Um, he then spoke about pushing and standing up to his party, pushing a discharge petition, but then because he was short two votes, completely caved into the leadership. He's been giving thousands of dollars to Republicans who are hardliner, anti-immigration um, officials. I mean, they're, they're completely against any sort of immigration reform, yet his own personal PAC, he's been giving money to these Republicans. He caved into his to the leadership in, in Congress knowing very well and knowing the background that they are not interested well, why, in, in finding a fix for this well, why problem. do you believe he if he, the pact that he created was to try to promote immigration reform he has given money to hardline republicans mm -hmm. who were opposed to immigration reform why do you believe he did that then i believe from seeing the actions and i'm just bringing truth to light from seeing all the actions that I've seen from Congressman Curbelo, he says one thing but goes to D.C. and does something else. So he, you know, says that he's for immigration reform, yet lets his party make the decisions instead of really truly working in a bipartisan form, which is what, what we need to do so that we can find a, a solution. So he's what he's doing is not really standing up for his community and that's my frustration when I well, see let's, let's talk about him talking about these issues well, let's talk about another issue the economy there was an excellent jobs report 213,000 jobs added to the economy the current administration heralds that as showing that unemployment rate mm -hmm. is, a, is a very near very low level the economy seems to be doing well um, isn't that an issue alone that, that that you could say Republicans should remain in charge because the economy is ahead in the right direction um, absolutely not, and I'll tell you why. I think that we are seeing growth in the economy because of the policies that we saw under the Obama administration, and we're still seeing the effects of that. This is not under the Trump administration. And what I'm very concerned about is that the more families that I talk to, the more people that I talk to, they are struggling. They're not making ends meet. So the economy jobs report looks good, but wages are still at the same level as they were two, three years ago. Wages Things. have not been really going exactly, up. Right. Exactly. So we see... Um, um, costs of you know goods and services Gasoline. gas prices mm -hmm. have gone up um, now with these tariffs that we're going to be discussing that's going to affect the cost of a lot of goods and services that we depend on as consumers so 
you know, who's benefiting from this economy well, right let's now? Let's talk about the trade war with China. You represent, or we're hoping to represent, mm -hmm. a district that would include the Florida Keys, the Keys commercial fishermen. We're going to do a story on that in a second. Could be severely adversely affected by, by these trade tariffs. What is your position when it comes to these tariffs that the Trump administration is imposing on China? Uh, again, it's... You know, what I'm seeing is one person, one man making these unilateral decisions that are going to affect uh, our economy in a very drastic way. He is escalating a trade conflict with our allies, with Canada, Mexico, now China, that we're all ultimately going to be paying the consequences. And the fisheries in Monroe County are still recuperating from Hurricane Irma. Um, they lost millions of dollars due to the hurricane, and they really haven't seen a lot of relief coming from the federal or state government at this point. So this is going to affect them directly. <clears throat> it's an industry that brings about $50 million um, to Monroe County. And so I'm extremely concerned well, about what that's going to do to, to the industry. You were referring to President Trump as the person who's behind this. Yeah. I, I got a statement from Car Congressman Corbello about this. He said he's also disappointed by the new tariffs and thinks that they don't show, you know, the right vision in terms of the Trump administration should have expected this. So he's disappointed. You're disappointed. What would you do anything different than what, what he's doing right now? Look, Congress has the power to do something. Let's let's be clear about that. The, the problem is that the Republicans are not standing up to Trump. They're not. We have to have, I think it's a two-thirds majority to be able to override a veto right by the president. So there is something that Congress could do. And I assure you that the Democrats would get together to try to do something. And that's why it's so important to elect Democrats in November. Well, I'm curious, if, if Democrats are elected and take over the House and you are in the House, will you vote for uh, Nancy Pelosi to be Speaker? Um, I've said, I've been asked that question over and over again, and I've said it time and time again, whoever I vote for has to be aligned with the values of my community. That's going to be my ultimate decision-making process. Um, I have seen Lee, Nancy Pelosi come down to Florida. I have seen her fight for health care accessibility and lowering health care costs. I have seen her stand up for dreamers. So my answer is yes, I would support her. We have just about 45 seconds. You mentioned health care. Talk to me about where you would differ from Congressman Corbello on health care. I would not have voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act in a district which depends, you know, we have the second largest number of people that depend on the ACA in this district, over 100,000 families. What I would do is protect what we have, look at ways to improve that, lower costs, and provide more accessibility to everyone in the district. David Ricasso Powell, thank you very much for coming in. I should note that we are working to try to get Congressman DeCabell to come on the show. He has an open invitation. Anytime he wants to come in, he can sit here for, we'll give him the entire half hour to talk about the issues. Well, hopefully he'll take us up on it. Up next, the trade war with China hits the lobstermen of the Florida Keys. This year, CBS 4 News produced a half-hour special, The Business of Lobster, which explored how the commercial fishing industry in the Florida Keys was saved in recent years when China began importing live Florida lobsters. The high prices the Chinese were willing to pay meant most of the lobster caught in Florida was ultimately shipped there. 
But now the growing trade war with China is threatening to throw the Keys fishing industry into disarray. On Friday, the United States imposed $34 billion in tariffs against goods coming into the United States from China. And China immediately retaliated on U.S. goods. And for the Florida Keys fishermen, the news was not good. In Marathon, thousands of lobster traps are waiting to be dropped in the water for the start of next month's lobster season. Typically for commercial fishermen like Gary Nichols, this is a time of hopeful anticipation, but these are not typical days. It's starting to get a little scary. Nine years ago, Nichols saw the price of lobster drop to $3 a pound, and he nearly lost everything. Then along came the Chinese, who started buying as much lobster as they could get their hands on, shipping it live to China. We've been very fortunate over the last several years with the Chinese market. At its height, lobster prices hit $24 a pound. In recent years, it has settled to an average price of $10. But now the trade war threatens everything. If we go back down without this Chinese market, we're looking at a lobster price that's you know down there in a five, six dollar range, which just doesn't pay the bills. And with the fuel cost increasing, the labor cost increasing, and, and running these businesses, it's gonna be a real struggle. I mean, especially coming off a hurricane season where we lost a million dollars, um, and, and it's gonna take years to rebuild after this storm. Today, a new storm approaches. We can't continue to allow China to rape our country, and that's what they're doing. It's the greatest theft in the history of the world. As a candidate, Trump regularly blasted China, accusing its leaders of taking advantage of the United States. And as president, he promised action, declaring on Twitter, trade wars are good and easy to win. In March, Trump hit China with a tariff on steel and aluminum. China responded with $3 billion in tariffs on items such as nuts and sparkling wine. In April, Trump hit China again with an additional $34 billion in tariffs on Chinese-made computers, dishwashers, and medical devices, among other things. Those tariffs went into effect on Friday. China immediately fired back with $34 billion on U.S. goods, including soybeans, poultry, pork, and beef. Those tariffs also went into effect on Friday and tucked into the list of 545 products were lobsters, whether they come from Florida or Maine, and whether they are alive, frozen, or processed. I was really praying that that wasn't gonna occur, and at this moment, I don't know what's going to happen. We're all just in limbo. To stay competitive, Florida lobster men are going to have to drop their prices. Otherwise, buyers in China will simply start purchasing lobster from Australia, Brazil, or Nicaragua. I'm just hoping and, uh, our president can resolve this these uh, this little trade war he's got going. Jeff Kramer is a longtime Keys commercial fisherman who operates a fish house in Marathon. He buys lobster from as many as 20 different boat captains and then sells them to the Chinese brokers. A lot of us voted for him, and you know maybe this will work out in the long run, but for the short term, it's uh, it's going to really devastate us. So how are you feeling about Trump now? Well, let's see what happens. You know, he got Rocket Man to back down. Let's see if he can get the Chinese president to back down. Gary Nichols also voted for Trump and is standing by him. I think he's doing a good job. I really do. He's a smart man. He's a lot smarter than I am. And he's a businessman that makes a lot of money. I just hope some of these little guys like ourselves with little family businesses, I just hope maybe he sees something. They even thought about writing him a letter trying to be more one-on-one -on -one with him and get him to to see what you know who's affected. Both Nichols and Kramer said they understand why the president is engaging in this fight. Maybe it'll help it give us a help in hand because we've been at a disadvantage. Now we're at more of a disadvantage advantage. Hey, how Larry, how you how doing? You're good, good, good. This is the head guy I've been telling you about. He's the biggest uh, lobster buyer in the United States. We first met Larry Yi earlier this year. He is one of several brokers who buy lobster in the United States and then sells it to eager buyers in China. Everything looks good until the sheriff came in. We spoke to Yi as he was on his way to China to try and renegotiate his prices with his distributors and buyers. Right now, we don't know what to expect. Yi said China has always treated the U.S. unfairly. For instance, China places a 17% tax and duty on lobster imported from the United States. It's a fee other countries don't pay. Why 17%? We shouldn't pay them at all. And as part of his business, Yi imports fish and crabs from China to the United States. There's no taxes here. 
no import taxes, no no duty, no nothing. And, but for our goods to go into China, yes, there's, there's, there's taxes, there's duty, and now tariffs. It's, it's insane. In the meantime, Nichols never thought his family's fate could be tied to the outcome of a global trade war. It's taught him a valuable lesson. Sooner or later, it does trickle down to the little guy. And we are the little guys, but we support this country. We feed a lot of people in this nation, but maybe we all need to back down, take some tax off, and let's just do business. Lobster season formally begins August 6th. We'll keep you posted on the impact. We'll be right back after the break. join us next week on Facing South Florida. I'm Jim DeVitti. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Get your day.